Dude, let's stand to our feet and let's sing with heart to God be the glory. Hymn number 5-2, to God be the glory. Lift up your voices now. To God be the glory, great things he had done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Who yielded his life and atonement for sin. And of men the life gave that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth in. Instruments drop out when we come to the chorus on the last. Great things, great things he had taught us, great things he had done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he has done. Let's remain standing with heads bowed and eyes closed. Let's quietly look to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather together for worship. We pray that you would empower the preaching of your word. We pray that you'll speak to hearts. Lord, that it would not just be we came to church and we checked it off a list. But, Lord, that we'd all be here to get something today. Would you speak to us, I pray. And if there's someone here today that does not know for sure that they're born again, that if they died, heaven would be their eternal home. If they don't know that they're saved, I pray that you'll especially minister to that heart and show them today the way of salvation through Christ. We pray it in his name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let's continue singing 473. 473 is our next hymn, Yield Not to Temptation, For Yielding is Sin. 473, let's think about the words as we sing. Four seventy-three as we start singing. Yield not to temptation for yielding is sin. Victory will help you some other to win by mentally onward the passions of doom. Look ever to Jesus, He will carry you through as the 
Savior to help you, comfort, strength, and I keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. God's name hold in reverence, nor take it in vain. Be thoughtful and earnest, kind hearted and true. Look ever to Jesus, he will carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you. And the third, to him that all come and God give it the crown. Morning to Cornerstone Baptist Church. We're glad to have each one of you here present today, especially our visitors. And if you are a first time visitor at Cornerstone Baptist Church, we want to thank you for coming. We certainly won't ask that you say or do anything. You don't have to give a speech, but we want you to know that we're honored to have you. And if you are a first time visitor, we have a visitor's card for you. If you'll just slip your hand up if this is your first time with us, the ushers will file through and they'll give you a visitor's card as well as a pen to fill it out with. Take that card when you get it, open it up, tear it in half, keep the side with the picture and the order of services and put the other section in the offering plate when it comes by in just a moment. And we're glad to have you here today at Cornerstone Baptist Church. And uh, just one thing, while the pastor's talking, you shouldn't be. Thank you, young people. When the pastor's talking, when someone's up here talking, keep your mouths closed. I'm going to go through, thank you. I'm going to go through announcements as we prepare to take up our offering. But again, let me say it's good to have you if you're a visitor. I uh, greeted some gentlemen from the Pacific Garden Mission today visiting with us. Glad to have you. Uh, with us today, uh, met Luke, who is a junior at the University of Chicago studying math. Good to have you and some other visitors, some new faces. It's an honor to have you here. We're glad that you came, and we hope God's word will speak to your heart as it is preached today. Just to go through the announcements, uh, this Sunday, the evening service will be at 5 o'clock. We will have our men's accountability ministry meeting afterward. We want to thank those that gave of themselves for the candy sale we hit our goal uh, by about $900 over and uh, just praise the Lord for his help and safety with that fundraiser. I'll be meeting tonight to go over the Ark Encounter trip uh, in Kentucky. And so if you are part of that group that will be going, students, I need to meet with you. Parents, I need to meet with you and potential chaperones. I'm going to need a few chaperones uh, to go with us on the trip. We will talk about that tonight. Um, Come to the meeting, Chaperone, if you're interested in coming and interested in paying uh, to come. All right, that kind of that kind of thins out the crowd. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure I said that. But that'll be tonight after the evening service. Um, Wednesday, Bible study and prayer time at seven o'clock. Tuesday, we will be back at the pavilion. Now that candy sale is over, school chapel will be Thursday at eight thirty-five. Saturday, men's and women's prayer meeting at nine o'clock. Bus and soul winning meeting at 9.30. Couple things. We ask that once the preaching of God's word begins,
that we not have people getting up and walking out of the service while the preaching is going on. Um, why? Somebody tell me why. Yes. It's disrespectful to God's word. So once the preaching begins, we ask that we not have people standing up, leaving, coming back in, out, in. It is dishonoring to the word of God, and it is a distraction as well. And so unless there's a physical emergency, you should not be leaving the service during the preaching time. Help us with that. You can't get anything out of the preaching if you are disturbed or you are a disturbance, okay? And so please help us with that. Young people, it's good to see a good group of teenagers in church on a Sunday morning. We're, we're glad for that, but teenagers look this way. If for any reason I'm talking, look this way, this way, okay? Should not be talking in church. The talking should stop. If for any reason you are a disturbance to the church service, my first line of recourse is to have you come sit in the front row. Okay, I'll just pick you out and say, come sit in the front row. If that doesn't work, we're just going to send you out and have you sit on the other side and play with your thumbs. Okay, and so if you don't want that embarrassment, then do right in church. Okay, because I am going to be watching like a laser those that aren't acting right in church. Okay, thank you for that. If you have a cell phone, please power it off at this time so that it's not a distraction uh, to the preaching of God's word. Check that. October is marriage month. We are emphasizing God's institution of marriage. Marriage, contrary to what you've been told. Who lied to you? Marriage is a good thing. It is a biblical thing, and God ordained it, and it keeps us out of all kinds of trouble, and God tells us how that marriage can be right. And uh, then it's up to us to obey it. All month we'll be preaching on marriage. Uh, this morning I'll be preaching a message on abortion and tying it into marriage month. And then tonight I'll be preaching what I think will be the most important message of the month. Not that any of them are unimportant. They're all important. But if I had to pick one topic that I'm going to preach on that I believe is the most important in regards to marriage, it's tonight. Uh, and that is communicating with your spouse. We all need that. So make sure if you're married or plan to be married, you're here for that message. We'll be preaching at the Pacific Garden Mission on October the 31st, meeting here at 6 o'clock to pray, and then going to preach the word. Call to Glory devotionals are here, and so I encourage you to get one of those to supplement your daily Bible study. Ushers, if you'll come, we'll take up this morning's offering. And if Michael Brown, if you'd come and ask the Lord's blessing as we worship him and give. Let's pray. Dearly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for Lord the ministry of giving. God, just being able to give to your work. Lord, it's a, it's a good thing, God. And I pray, Lord, that you will bless this offering that you were about to take up. Lord, help us, Lord, to give, Lord, with a cheerful heart, Lord, knowing that it's going to a good cause, God. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, for the ability that you've given us to give, Lord. It's a, it's a ministry, a personal ministry to give, God. And I thank you for having us to, to have the ministry, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you'll be with the sermons today, that you will speak the hearts, Lord, and Lord, lives will be changed, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <laughs>
Juan Riesco has given his life to the Lord to serve, I like to think of it as a missionary, two abortion clinics, one in particular, which is the most busiest one in the city. And he is the Chicago director, full-time director for Love Life. And I have asked him to come and to give us about 10 minutes of an introduction to the ministry. Hope he'll tell us a little bit about his testimony. It is as um, amazing as it is miraculous how God saved him. And um, I just hope that God will take his testimony time, his time introducing his work, and take the morning message and that it will dovetail together into something that especially the young people will never forget. So Brother Juan, if you come. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here today. As Pastor said shortly ago, I work here in Chicago um, with a ministry called Love Life. And my function is to be a missionary, exactly what Pastor said, to unborn babies. Uh, my mission field is the abortion clinic, as Pastor said. Um, but I do want to start by saying I've heard of your great faith heard of the great faith of this church. That's actually how I became acquainted with it. I heard of the refusal to close when tyrannical government powers were trying to force you all to do so. So I give God all the glory for that. I believe it was Charles Spurgeon who once said, when God wants to judge a nation, he sends them wicked rulers. And so I think the opposite must be true then. When God wants to bless a church, he sends them godly leaders. So I praise God for a pastor and his family for being such godly leaders and leading us through that season of 2020. Um, I didn't grow up in ministry. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Um, I grew up here in the city of Chicago, born and raised. Um, by the age of 20, I became, or, I'm sorry, my teenage years, I became a homosexual. And by God's grace, at the age of 23, the Lord saved me from my life of sin and wickedness. Amen. And now by God's grace, I'm married to a woman. And, we have three beautiful children in Jesus' name. So we give God all the glory for that. But when I got saved, the Lord led me to work in my family's business. My mom and dad owned a restaurant, and so I served alongside of them for about 10 years in Jesus' name. God prospered that business and made it very successful. And by 2020, we were posed with a proposition from our, the city of Chicago, and it was bow your knee to the Black Lives Matter movement or get out of Chicago was essentially what we were presented with. We said in the name of Jesus, because we're a Christian business, we will not stand with any organization that stands alongside of homosexuality and abortion, which is what the BLM movement does. And when we said that, we were uh, protested then by the thousands, um, people from this movement, and uh, they, were t they told me they were gonna kill me, kill my family, and kill my uh, son, who was in the womb at the time because we refused to support their organization. God used that season to build in me a faith. The scriptures teach us that with all pain, God has a plan. And I believe God was training me. Shortly after that season, God had put a burden in my heart for abortion clinics. I said, Lord, I have a family to feed. I already do so much ministry by God's grace. I'm making disciples of young men in my church. I lead the evangelism ministry. Like many of you here, I'm, I'm a street preacher. I'm in the streets. Before the abortion clinic, was already in the streets one, sometimes two times a week by God's grace, preaching the gospel. And I really believe the Lord was putting a burden in my heart to move my street evangelism to abortion clinics at least once a week. This is before I ever heard of the ministry I now work for. And I said, okay, God, I'm going to go. So by God's grace, I did my best to go to the abortion clinics and bring, preach the gospel, the good news of life and death to a lost and dying world. And I did it in Jesus' name. I did, was as faithful as I could for about three months, and that's when I received a phone call from this ministry called Love Life. And they said, Juan, we're looking to expand to Chicago in Jesus' name. It's a very abortion-centric city. And we're looking for somebody who'd be willing to preach the good news of Jesus Christ outside of abortion clinics at least once a week. I was thinking to myself, I've already been doing that by God's grace. The Lord put that on my heart. And so I knew for certain that that was confirmation that this is where God wanted me. Amen. 
And so in Jesus' name, Love Life Ministries functions to help unite and mobilize local churches to bring the hope of the gospel and the help of the local church to abortion-minded moms and dads. We believe in Jesus' name that the gospel and the church together as one, as they've always been since the beginning of time, is the answer to sin and evil in our society. We are not a humanitarian effort. Amen. We are not uh, liberal Democrats or something like this. We are a gospel-centered ministry that focuses on uniting and mobilizing the local church to bring the gospel to abortion clinics. Amen. By God's grace, our ministry has been nationwide since 2014. In Jesus' name, that has resulted in 800 partnering churches all across the nation. That has resulted in close to a quarter million born-again Christians filled with the Spirit of God, going out to abortion clinics, lifting their hands, praying and interceding on behalf of unborn babies. And in Jesus' name, that has resulted in 5,000 babies being saved from abortion in the nation, in this nation. Since we launched in Chicago, we've helped, which was February of this year, the Lord has allowed us, through the preaching of his word and the uniting and mobilizing of his people, to save 23 here in the city alone. Amen. We've helped bring around close to 400, almost 500 people to the abortion clinics. Born-again Christians, not Roman Catholics, born-again Christians to those clinics Amen. to share the good news. And so my hope is that I could partner alongside of this beautiful church to help train, mobilize, and equip anybody who has a heart for this. Uh, Pastor Courtney and I had the honor of going out to the clinics together. I got to show him the mission field. We looked moms in the face who are on the way to go do something so sinful. We got to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. We believe that God's people going out to these dark places is the solution, nothing else. We believe we need political change, but political change isn't the solution. Jesus and his gospel and his people is. We want politicians and, and legislation to follow the move of God. Not the move of God come after the politicians. Amen? The church is the head. Politicians are the tail. We go forth in Jesus' name, and we believe that's the solution. And if you also believe that God's word and God's people is the solution, I would love, love to partner with this wonderful church. You can meet me in the back, and I'd love to participate in that uh, growing uh, and mobilizing of you all, if, if it be God's will. Behind me, uh, just a quick story of how powerful God's word is. Not me, uh, not my preaching style, but God's word. Amen. This is a clipboard from the abortion clinic. As you can see, there's no papers on it. I had approached a car one Wednesday morning, and there was a young man sitting in it. I, the, 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 the curb is kind of high, so I'm looking down at him. He has to push his hair to the side to look at me. And, he's, and I said, sir, are you here for the abortion clinic this morning? He says, well, not me, but my girlfriend is. And I said, I want you to know the Bible considers abortion murder. And he said, well, it's not me. It's my girlfriend. And I said, if I were to rob a bank this morning, and you are sitting in the passenger side, and I get arrested. Will you also be in trouble? Will you also be convicted? Would you be tried as well as the accomplice? Of course, absolutely I would be. And I said, young man, you are in the same predicament today. You have driven to an abortion facility where the ending of an innocent life will happen. You came as the accomplice. The Bible says God hates the hands that shed innocent blood. Proverbs 16. But here's the good news, young man. Today, if you repent from your sins, turn away, receive this gospel message, Christ can save you. Today can be the day, young man, that you leave your life of sin and enter eternal life with Christ. He closed the window shortly after that. Our conversation ended. I went for a walk around the building because oftentimes there's moms or dads straggling around the building, sometimes crying, looking for hope. By God's grace, when God's people are there, we get to offer them the hope. And so I'm looking, nothing happens. And by the time I get back around the block, his hand's sticking out the window like this with that clipboard. I thought he wanted me to give it back to the clinic because his girlfriend was filling out the papers when I approached the car. Excuse me. The second time I approached the car, his girlfriend was filling out the papers. So I thought for sure he'd say, hey, do me a solid. Hand this to the abortion clinic. That's what I, thought, that's what I presumed. 
I said, young man, I will not touch that clipboard. I said, I'm not going to help you in any way finish what you've started here. And he said, no. As you can see, there's no papers on the clipboard. Because after you preached to me, I took the papers off. And my girlfriend and I are going home. So when God's people do what God commanded us to do in Matthew 28, to go on to the nations, preach the gospel, and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that God has commanded us, souls are saved and lives can be saved. Thank you guys for having me. Assuming that couple follows through on that decision, can you imagine what kind of testimony that what kind of story they're going to be able to tell to that child when they are old enough to understand it, that they were at the clinic ready to kill, and by the preaching of the gospel, they made a, a better decision. Let's do some more singing this morning. I want you all to stand. 420, your maroon hymnals. 420 will be our last song this morning. My anchor holds 420. Let's sing it out if your anchor is holding on this morning. 420. Oh, the angry surges roll on my tempest driven soul. I am peaceful for I know. time and greet those around us.
as we make our way back to our seat, we'll stand in our place to sing verse number 4 or 420. As we stand in our seat, verse number 4. Troubles almost well the soul, grief's like bellows o'er me roll. Tempts to seek to lure astray, stones obscure the light of day. But in cry, I can't be bold. I've been anchored at Jehovah, and it holds. we are all back in our seat. I want us to settle in, but I do want us to sing the last verse because all our troubles almost overwhelm our soul on a daily basis, don't they? Yes. Our griefs like billows may roll over us, won't they? But we have an anchor that can hold. So let's sing about it. I want to sing verse number four one more time and I want the saints of God to sing out this morning. Here we go in verse four. Troubles almost whelm the soul, griefs like pillows on me roll, tempt to seek the Lord astray, storms obscure the light of day, but in Christ I can be bold, I'm an anchor that shall, let's sing it out this morning, and it holds. Beauty. 
masterpiece, a masterpiece of love, a masterpiece of love. Amen. Please take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of First Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. It's good to have Jeremy here today. And um, last time he was here, a couple months ago, he was in a wheelchair. And um, at some point, I'd love for you to hear his story, maybe from his own lips, but we'll see. He was shot how many times, Jeremy? Shot 10 times. And uh, he's in church today. And he can walk without the wheelchair and without his cane. And when I, last time I visited at his house, he said, there's a reason why I'm still here and I need to come to church and find out after being shot 10 times. So I'm, I'm glad he's here today as well. First Timothy chapter one, first Timothy chapter one now begins that quiet time where um, I will be very vigilant and watchful over the preaching ministry of this church. First Timothy chapter one, first Timothy chapter one, every October at Cornerstone Baptist Church, we celebrate marriage and we celebrate it by preaching and teaching on how to have a good, right, and biblical marriage that will stand the test of time and this year won't sink. That's the theme, keeping your marriage afloat in a wicked world. And as the world gets more and more ready, precious, for the second coming of Jesus Christ, as the stage is set for the appearance of the Antichrist, the greater the attack will be on the home. And I can say that the attack on the home is more fierce today than it was when this church was started. And that is exactly what the Bible said would happen. In the last days, perilous times would come. But I'm glad I'm holding God's word today. I'm glad I have a Bible that tells me how my, my home is supposed to run. I'm glad that I have a Bible that came from God. It is the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of the living God. And it has so much to say on how a husband-wife relationship should be ordered. God's word-for-word word book tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 19, it says, Holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Shipwreck. And we don't want to see marriages shipwrecked. We don't want to see homes and families shipwreck and so we're preaching on holding that faith and it's interesting to me that we have all of these resources on marriage and yet our homes are in a bigger mess now than they've ever been before all of the books sermons resources commentaries all of the helps good things things that can help but apparently, they're not. Why is that? I don't want to blame all of those books and resources, but please hear me. A lot of the Christian even resources are filled with secular humanism, psychology, worldliness, man's way of doing things, and false doctrine. Marriage is not a recipe where you can interchange the ingredients and still come up with something still good. That you can say, well, that was my grandma's recipe and I don't have this ingredient, so I'm gonna throw this in instead and it's still going to be okay. That's not how this thing called marriage works. There is one source of truth and it is the word of God. And there is absolute truth. We live in a world that says that we can't have absolute truth. Uh, yet when you ask those same people if they should positively have a paycheck at the end of their work week that says X amount of dollars, then all of a sudden they believe in absolute truth. 
No, we have absolute truth here. It is either Sunday today or it's not. We believe in absolute truth except when it comes to God. <laughs> but we have absolute truth when it comes to him. And so the preaching from this pulpit on the subject of marriage is not for sale. And Lena, it won't be thus saith Pastor Lewis. It won't be thus saith a deacon. It won't be thus saith a therapist. It won't be thus saith uh, uh, the, the, the seminar. It won't be thus saith the retreat or the podcast or the small group leader or the expert, the marriage expert on Christian radio. No, the preaching about marriage from this pulpit, as long as I have the privilege of being the pastor, is going to be thus saith the Lord. If you want your marriage to stay afloat, it must be you following thus saith the Lord. Notice, I did not say you hearing thus saith the Lord. You can hear it for 15, 20 years, and if you don't do it, you're going to be shipwrecked. The Bible says... In verse 19, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away. Some people say, I've heard it, but I don't want it. That's going to be people here today, sad to say. Okay? It's gonna, there's going to be people here today that will say, I'm hearing it, but I want to put it away. I don't want it. Well, the last word in verse number 19 is for you, and it is shipwreck. Turn aside from marriage as God ordained it, and you are getting ready for shipwreck. My anchor holds. It's not just a song that we're singing this month. Jesus Christ is the anchor. You can anchor yourself in God's word, and your family can stay afloat. Take your Bible and turn with me to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. The title of the message today is Abortion. Abortion. Pastor Lewis, how does that tie into marriage? About 4% of all abortions take place with a married woman. The mother, 96% of the time, is not married. Promiscuity is attached to abortion. Marriage drives the number of abortion way down. And if we can make one lady think twice, look this way, teenage girls, if we can make one of you teenage girls think twice before a baby is conceived and killed, then our time today will be well spent. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, verse number 13. Exodus 20, 13. The Bible says, thou shalt not kill. People say the Bible's too hard to understand. What's hard about that? Thou shalt not kill. It is a command, not an option. It is, of course, referring to murder. The Bible is not referring to self-defense. The Bible is not referring to capital punishment. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. It is not referring to war. Our prayer today is with Israel. We need to pray for Israel. They're under attack by terrorist enemies. And they're fighting back. And I hope they continue to fight back. Exodus 20, 13 is not referring to war. It's talking about murder. And look this way, teens. Look this way, teenagers. Look this way, this way. Not there. This, there you go. The Bible says, thou shalt not kill. I asked the bus workers to do everything they could to bring out as many teenagers as they could today. Listen, this is the Bible. God's word from God, the one who created this world. Thou shalt 
not kill. That includes an unborn baby. You don't believe that? There's the door. You can go right out and we're going to just keep on preaching. Thou shalt not kill. Go to Exodus chapter 21. Next chapter over. Look at verse number 12. This is God's mind on murder. Exodus 21, 12. The Bible says, He that smiteth a man so that he die shall surely be put to death. You murder, you deserve to die. That's the Bible. Now that's not our government today in most cases, but it is the Bible. Why? It is an attack on the image of God. We are created in the image of God. Therefore, to murder someone is an attempt, a frontal attack upon the image of God. We are created in his image. Look at verse number 22, same chapter. This now is a child in the womb. The Bible says in Exodus 21, 22, if men strive, in other words, if men get into a fight, and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. So if two men are fighting and they accidentally hit a woman, and that woman is pregnant, and that baby is killed, there's judgment. But what I want you to notice is that the baby in verse number 22 is called fruit. It says, and hurt a woman with child. What's it called in the womb? Somebody tell me. A child or fruit. That's not what the abortionists say. Hey, Nick, could you sit right in between those two? One of those kids on either side of you, just the ones you're sitting next to. Yep, just so that they're not talking and you can share your Bible right in the middle. I'm going to usher from up here today, okay? So if I see something, I'm going to stop and I'm not going to preach until it's taken care of. But the baby is called a child. It's called fruit. So I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask God to bless the message. It's not going to be a popular sermon, I guarantee you. But I pray that the Lord will use it, that souls will be saved, and that babies' lives will be spared from the slaughter which is called abortion. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, and I thank you that we can come together and hear your word. Lord, I thank you for Juan and his ministry that you've called him to. Empower him to continue saving lives and being used to save souls. Lord, we give you the glory for all the good that's been accomplished, but we thank you for those that are willing to surrender to do your work. Now, Lord, I, I pray for this message. I pray that your hand of power would be upon me as I preach. Give me clarity of thought. Lord, I pray for the ushers. You give them wisdom. I pray for uh, the young people that you'll help them to hear and that in the future, literal babies will be saved because we came together today. And I also pray for the souls of those that are without Christ, that today would be the day of their salvation. Oh Lord, bless, help, empower, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Murder has become a light thing in our society, such a low premium on life. Parents today are killing their children, both their born children and their unborn. If that child is born, they go to jail for killing their child. If that child is unborn, they get a pat on the back and encouragement along the way. Doctors whose purpose is to aid in healing are now using their profession to kill unborn children. Doctors used to have to swear the Hippocratic Oath, and that oath was originally 
an oath that included this line which showed a respect for human life. This quote has been taken out of the Hippocratic Oath, but this is how it used to read. I will give no deadly medicine to anyone if asked, nor suggest such counsel, and in like manner I will not give a woman a pessary to produce abortion. That line was dropped when abortion became legalized, conveniently dropped. Today, young women can be given a pill, and the pill can do its devastating work. When I was at the clinic with Juan, he was explaining it to me. Now they, they give you a pill, uh, they, they, and it starts the work, and I think they give you another pill, and that finishes the deadly work. And, and, and you can expel everything at home and you, mama, can clean up the mess. They, they've made it as guilt-free on their conscience as possible. They want you to go home and clean up the mess. Turn with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Look at Luke chapter 1, verse number 41. Luke chapter 1, verse number 41. Luke 1, 41. The Bible says, And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. What's this thing called? What's this person called? A babe. A babe. It's in the womb, but it's called a what? Don't forget that. It says, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, why did young John the Baptist in the womb leap for joy? Because he was in the presence of Christ, who was also a babe in Mary's womb. They were both 100% human. Watch me now. Public school students, watch me now. All students. They were not a blob. They were not a mass of tissue. This was not protoplasm. This was life. A babe. Life begins as soon as conception takes place. That child in the womb was alive. Elizabeth had a child in her womb. It was alive. Mary had a child in her womb. It was alive. Trinace has a child in her womb. That child is alive. But if she didn't want that baby, and she certainly 100% does, but if she didn't want that baby, she could march down to the clinic where Juan and I stood a couple weeks ago. She could walk in, take the clipboard, kill her baby. Alive. Alive means that the child is growing. It's being nurtured. It's maturing. It's replacing its own dying cells. It, alive means not dead. And if you go have an abortion, you're killing someone that's alive. And the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. I remember the ultrasounds with my girls. And I remember one in particular going to get the ultrasound and seeing the baby moving. One of my daughters. I remember seeing her cover her face. The ultrasound, there's one thing I know about those babies when I looked at those ultrasounds, other than the fact that they always said, Mr. Lewis, it's a girl. <laughs> there's another thing I know, that baby was alive. Alive! And as a live person, they have a right to live. And the one million babies that are being slaughtered in this country every year have a right to live. 
In this city, up until 15 years ago, right when this church started, it was illegal to own a handgun, to legally carry or even own a handgun to protect your children. Yet on the other hand, you could walk into a clinic and kill your children. What's wrong with our thinking? It's messed up. The men involved are cowards. I said cowards. I watched it with my own two eyes. Broke my heart to see the men pulling up in front of the clinics. Not even men enough to walk in with their girlfriends or their wives. Driving up in nice cars, Gucci bags. Don't believe the hype that it's just the poor people that need abortion. And I watched them pull up and the man just drop them off and the man just drive off. Cowards! Make a baby, then have a hand in killing it. Every possible justification for this crime is an excuse. It's an excuse. And I want to quickly examine the excuses for abortion. Number one, to save the life and health of the mother physically. Those who fight to protect a woman's right to kill her baby argue that abortion should be available to protect the life and the health of the mother. Now the truth is, is they want your money. That's the truth. But they care so much for the life and health of the mother, they say. And I say they shouldn't have the title of doctor. They don't deserve it. Now this message is not to be interpreted as a a lack of compassion on those who are in trouble or those who are immoral and have an unwanted pregnancy. We ought to have compassion. In our church, we reach out and we, and we try to witness and win and love everybody. We need compassion. But don't believe the lie that we need to keep abortion around to protect the life of the mother. It's a cop-out. Abortion is, 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 is done because that pregnancy inconveniences the life of that mother. And so she seeks to kill her child. Abortionists claim that all abortions are necessary. In other words, if you say for the life and health of the mother, you just allow that thing to be opened up for whatever reason you can make be the health of the mother. And I say God's in control of that. Not you and not me. We've had a couple of instances where God chose to take our child in the womb. He's in control. But it's not for us to lift our hand to slaughter our own children. God gave. He can take away. Who are we to play God when it comes to life? And it's a hypothetical situation. The life of the mother. And if you look at the percentages of when that is the case, it's a straw man. It's a hypothetical situation. It's manufactured, but it won't undo. Thou shalt not kill. Abortion is for the convenience of the parents. For the life of the mother is always expanded to mean anything that's unhealthy for the mother. It becomes abortion on demand. It morphs into that very easily. Number two, to save the health of the mother mentally. Abortion is needed to save the health of the mother mentally. Listen to the sinful logic. For the sake of my mental health, I'm going to kill my baby. No, kill your baby and you're setting yourself up for a whole new set of mental challenges. Including guilt, which, praise the Lord, can be washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. But the guilt of murder. In Roe v. Wade, Judge Douglas elaborated on what mental health means in relation to abortion. He said, if the woman, quote, 
had to endure the discomforts of pregnancy, incur the pain, higher mortality rate, after effects of childbirth, to abandon educational plans, hmm, to sustain loss of income, to forego the satisfaction of careers, to tax further mental and physical health in providing childcare, and in some cases to bear the long-term stigma of an unwed motherhood. Those are all concerns, but they ought to be concerns before jumping in bed. They ought to be concerns before fornication, but once that child is conceived, they are a child before God. So the only pro-choice I'm for in regards to this is the choice not to fornicate. But don't blame the child. It's not the child's fault. An abortion can't kill the guilt. You hear me? Many women are very hesitant about getting an abortion, but they go on with it anyhow because they've been told by others that it won't bother them. But five or ten years later, guess what happens? It starts to bother them. And again, if they have Christ, they have forgiveness. Full forgiveness. Complete forgiveness. And they don't have to be a slave to that guilt, but it is real. And without Christ, they're setting themselves up for a nervous breakdown. 44% admit that they should not have done it five or ten years later. Almost half say it was a mistake. With the years passing, they start thinking of how old that child would be right now. They start seeing kids the same age as what that child would be. They see those kids playing and they think to themselves, my baby would be about that age. Oh, what did I do? Depression, they have to run to a pill, guilt, remorse, shame, sleepless nights, reduced confidence, they're thinking, flashbacks, nightmares. The point is, abortion does not assist mental health. It destroys it. Abortion is always for the convenience of parents. Number three, the third excuse, rape or incest. Rape or incest. We must approach these rare instances with great Compassion, because it's possible that it can happen to any woman. And it's horrific. But out of 170,000 completed rapes, there's about 170 pregnancies. Out of 170,000, 170 pregnancies. So about one or two pregnancies out of 1,000 rapes. What's the point? Abortion is next to never because of rape and incest. Next to never. Okay? Now, it would take the power of Almighty God for me to forgive a man that forced my wife. A woman in this predicament needs our love, our prayers, our help. She needs to know that that was a wicked thing for that man to do and that he is a wicked man and he is accountable to his creator but does she need to return the violence by abortion does she need to return evil for evil will the shame of rape be lessened by killing the child that child is half the rapist but it's also half hers and there's other options besides murdering the unborn it's wrong to kill an innocent baby because of the crime of the father. You say that's easy for you to say because you're a man. No, it's easy for me to say because God said thou shalt not kill. And it's easy for me to say because I've seen an ultrasound. And that baby's alive. It's alive. One radical feminist in 1985 said, quote, to make abortion legal, only in cases of rape and incest would force women to lie. She was being honest. She was being very honest. She was saying people would just lie because most abortions are not because 
of rape or incest. Listen to me, 99% of abortions are not because of rape and not because of incest. It's just a woman that wants an easy way out. Throughout history, pregnant women who were criminals and sentenced to death would be given a stay of execution until the child was born. Abortion is always for the convenience of the parents. You say, what does that have to do with marriage? It's marriage month. The statistics say that married women almost never get an abortion. Out of 100 women that get an abortion, okay, 96 are unmarried. What does that say to you about God's institution of marriage and its power to help preserve life? It has everything to do with marriage. I would encourage you, if you have some time, to watch the real-time ultrasound video of a 12-week abortion three months, a suction abortion. It's available. It's called the silent scream. I remember watching it when Portia was about 12 weeks pregnant with one of our girls. The film is narrated by a former abortionist. The doctor does the narration. Many have tried to discredit it, but that same doctor who performed that very abortion verified that it's real. Captured on film is the unborn baby dodging the suction instrument, dodging it. And time after time, that baby's dodging the suction instrument and its heart rate is doubling in speed. When finally caught, its body is cut up, dismembered, and the baby clearly opens its mouth wide. That's why the video is called The Silent Scream. Now, praise the Lord, abortion can be forgiven. It's forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for all sins, not just abortion. All sins. He was buried, he arose again on the third day. But you must own up to it and repent of your sin and take Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Adoption is a merciful option. Amen. Jericho, amen, because he was adopted. It's a merciful option, and it is an option, a better one than murder. People are locked up in jail for killing their dog. Now, now listen to me. There was a man this year in Michigan who was put in jail for 60 days for killing his neighbor's dog. A dog! Yeah, you can kill your baby and be congratulated for it. Now, if you don't like what I'm about to say, you know where the door is. But how could you call yourself a Christian and vote for a candidate that wants abortion on demand? How can you? Instead of you checking out what they want to do for your pocketbook and give you all kinds of freebies, you need to find out where they stand on life. And that'll make you real unpopular. Use your head. Look at Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Let's see what Psalm 139 has to say about life. Psalm 139, verse number 13. Get as many young people as possible looking at the Bible. Psalm 139, verse 15. Read it for yourself. It says, for thou, meaning God, for thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance, what does that mean? Your makeup, your body. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made or conceived in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts 
of the earth. Go to Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24. This verse makes me thankful for uh, what Brother Juan is doing, and I think that it'll, it'll challenge us all to make sure we're on the right side of this issue, on the right side of this issue. Now, now listen, so, some of you believe everything that I preach from the Bible today, yet you're still going to go back to your family and to your job and be neutral on this. And, and you know what that is? That's a stinking compromiser. Listen, if you believe something's right, be willing to champion for it. Don't just go back and be quiet. Speak up. Tell people the truth. Look, look at Proverbs chapter 24, verse number 11. The Bible says, if thou forbear, that means to delay. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto that death, and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, behold, we knew it not, Doth not he that pondereth the heart considereth it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth he not know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? The, the Bible is clear. Don't, don't you dare be on the wrong side of this issue. Quiet about it. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. These young people looking at the Bible here. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Verse number 15. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse number 15. The Bible says, See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments that thou mayest live and multiply and that the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it now listen I I'm done but but look this way if there is any woman here today that knows the Lord, and in your past before coming to Christ, you had an abortion. You also know the loving, tender, kindness of the God of heaven. You know the forgiveness of sins. Praise the Lord. God knows my heart. I didn't preach this message to pour salt in anybody's wounds. I preach this message because of all of these teenage girls in this room today who don't have to make the same decision. And, and I'm not going to be silent about it. Okay? I'm not going to be silent about the fact that abortion's murder and we ought to take the right stand on it. On September 6, 2023, this year, as Brother Juan mentioned, he invited me to go with him to the gates of hell. Afterward, I sat in my car and I just had goosebumps on my arms. And really, I wanted to weep over what I had witnessed. He took me to the busiest abortion clinic in the city of Chicago, 659 West Washington Boulevard. And there is an atmosphere of death on that corner. You can feel it. You see these cars pull up, and you see these women getting out, sometimes with smiles on their faces, laughing. As Brother Juan was preaching, one lady shouted back to the abortion clinic workers there that were standing outside, uh, uh, I got to do what I got to do. He's not going to take care of my baby. She called it a baby. Did you hear that? From her own mouth, she knew what that was inside of her. That got me riled up. She called it a baby. It was chilling. 
the, the, the workers outside have, have water bottles that they crinkle to drown out Brother Juan's preaching. And he's just bold, preaching the gospel. I want to encourage him. Preaching repentance, preaching the cross, preaching salvation. And you know what they do? They spit in his face. They spit on him. Okay? They're, they're in the process of getting sued because they spit on him. I hope they, I hope they can sue him out of business. Amen. And children are being salvaged and souls are being saved. And I ask you, church, when you hear, it may be a Saturday, it may be some other time, but when you hear the announcement that we're going to mobilize and go, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Father, I pray that you'll take today's message, save souls, and save life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please quietly stand to your feet with your heads Thank you for viewing our live stream service today. We want to let you know that our service doesn't end with the conclusion of today's message. Not a time to look around at your friend. Heads bowed, eyes closed. It's a time for you to respond to the truth that was preached. It's been over a decade since I preached the full sermon on abortion, and I remember the last time that I preached it, some teenage girls came to the altar and said, I will never kill my baby. And I praise God for that. Girls, I want to invite you to do the same thing that those girls did 10 years ago. Come to this altar and tell God, I'll never kill my baby. It starts with salvation. Understanding the truth of God begins with understanding who is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you're here today and you're not born again, if you're not saved, I will meet you here at the bottom of the altar. You just come forward and take this preacher by the hand and say, Pastor Lewis, I need to be saved. I need Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. I want to be saved today. I don't want to leave the church today with my sins still there. I need them all blotted out. I need, him. I need those sins taken away. I want relief.